Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I can't see you, which is a weird thing, but um, but uh, I'm really happy to be able to share what I think is actually um, some brightness out of a particularly uh, dark day that we've experienced um, in this country and actually in the world. And, um, and so I'm looking forward to sharing what I have learned over these past two decades about this remarkable rescue um, and the people involved and also um, what I've come to think about, how it sort of transformed my thinking about some of the more um, uh, expected or sort of typical 9-11 um, narratives that, that have cropped up um, over these past two decades. So I wanted to start just by running down some of the details of what happened on that day. Um, and I really want to, sh to speak for a short time and then really be able to tailor my comments to your questions. Um, and so the first few slides, just to let you know what's happening, um, it, they're really um, just sort of running down the, the, the time frame and the facts and figures of the chronology of what happened at, um, at Ground Zero at the World Trade Center that morning. And then um, I have just some images um, of the boat lift that I wanna use just as a springboard to talk about some of the different elements and factors that I discovered. Um, and just on a little, a little bit of backstory, I, um, I actually spent a lot of time in Kingston um, and uh, with the fireboat. Um, and also I wrote my earlier book, My River Chronicles, actually in this little rented space in Port Ewan. And so um, Rondell Creek is dear to my heart and, um, and uh, the museum is a very special place. And, um, and so I am excited to be able to share this um, with you all. Um, I am going to look for, okay. So one of the things I think is important in terms of uh, capturing the, um, the real sense of what went on um, on September 11th at the World Trade Center site is that we have to forget so much of what we learned afterwards. We have to forget um, that we know how things ended up and we have to try to put ourselves in the shoes of um, the shoes of people who uh, were there just experiencing the catastrophe as it's unfolding with the absolute naivete of um, Americans, all of us, I think, um, just just disappear, just destroyed within this really short time period. And so one of the things pertaining to the boat lift that we forget is that um, even at 846, when this first plane crash is happening, that many, many people are um, assuming to be a uh, an accident. And uh, many people thought it was a small plane. Some people saw that it was a jet straight away, and we'll get to that. Um, but right away, this was something that was going to affect the maritime community, even if it was just an accident, even if it was not the terrorist attacks that, um, that eventually you know, we realized what was going on. So immediately we have, um, probably be helpful if I had a, a, a map here, which I do have in the book, and I realize it would be helpful on the slide, but essentially because of the shape of Manhattan Island and the fact that Manhattan is an island, um, that really affected everything that happened next. Um, and the World Trade Center is right adjacent to the World Financial Center, uh, the World Financial Center is a or was a regular terminal for the New York Waterway ferries. And so they were that morning doing what they do every morning, which is dealing with rush hour traffic um, and, you know, taking commuters uh, back and forth, but mostly onto the island. And um, and what happened was that based on where you were geographically, there were at different points throughout the day. Um, geography meant everything. I mean, split seconds and inches determined so many people's fate that day. So for people who were there caught in the, even if it was just an accident, the first plane crash, we forget now that this was immediately 
a really, really serious situation because things got so much worse. We sort of forget how bad it was right from the very beginning. And so there are reports straight away from um, 847 where you have ferry operators recognizing that there was something bad that happened at the World Trade Center and knowing that that was going to impact what their job was that day. And the first thing that happened was they realized that there were going to be transportation disruptions, which there were within a minute after the first plane hit. There were the first disruptions to the path train, the first emergency calls for the MTA, the subway system. Um, and so you have a whole bunch of people on an island uh, in the middle of the beginning, no, at the beginning of this catastrophe. And that um, what happens to them is determined by the geography of the situation. So very, very quickly, the uh, especially the ferry boats became waterborne ambulances. We forget now because again, of how bad things eventually got that immediately there were horrific fireballs that shot down through the elevator shafts um, uh, immediately after the impact of the plane. And there was all of this burning aviation fuel. Um, there were, there was glass that was shattered, a lot of, you know, plate glass windows and doors that broke Im immediately. And so immediately you have people who are horribly injured um, right away. And the easiest way to get many of them medical attention was by boat to actually take the ferry to New Jersey where there were very quickly, there were ambulances marshalling along the shore. And I'm gonna to get to those pictures in a few. Um, but I, I write in my book about many different individuals and I came to realize that, the, um, that it's the individuals that no one's any more important than anybody else really that it's just it's a collective effort that ends up really telling the story that day and so one of the people who i end up um you end up meeting in the book saved at the seawall is captain pat harris and he um this is not that day but these are pictures just to sort of give you a sense of his vessel so he was sitting having coffee aboard his charter sailing yacht and so this is a a, a kind of boat that he would take people out for fancy sailing cruises to have a dinner or hors d'oeuvres or something like that. And so he was just getting ready for another day of charters when he was, where we are geographically is very, very close. We're in North Cove Marina, which is um, just adjacent to the World Trade Center towers. And um, so his story becomes important because he is the first person to announce to the Coast Guard, um, first person to call it in because he's so close in proximity, what has happened. And um, in, in the two decades since, we actually have that call, um, which I'll play for you, it's very short, um, but just this is the beginning. This is the beginning of everything happening. <laughs> West Coast Guard, uh, Ventura. Uh, Ventura here at the World Trade Center. Uh, it's been a major explosion top of the World Trade Center, so you might need to know. Uh, Ventura, uh, Ventura, 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 Ventura. So he, um, he, it's really interesting because memory is fallible, and I don't know if any of you all, um, read the recent piece by John, uh, sorry, by Dan Barry in the New York Times, um, but he talks about the declarative, never forget, never forget, and really what does that mean and how really flawed individuals' memories of where, when, and how they actually learned of the terrorist attacks that morning, um, that, that people years later absolutely misremembered what they had told people in the immediate aftermath about how they had learned. And so the way that um, Captain Harris and I spoke, he had talked about how he, um, that he had a hard time saying the words which he knew to be true, which was, it was a jet, it was a jet, it was a jet. And so that, that moment of not knowing whether he said it, whether he didn't say it, but he knew that those were the words that wanted to come out, but that he couldn't pronounce because it was just so unfathomable. Um, so let's see here. 
So as I was mentioning, immediately there's an expanded ferry service that's going to be necessary. So you have bridges and tunnels. You're on an island of Manhattan, which many people, all of us, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and we forget that Manhattan is an island. And, um, and immediately you have closures. So the bridges and tunnels that we take for granted as connecting all five boroughs, as, as connecting Manhattan to everybody else and everything else, we take them for granted that they're always going to be there. And all of a sudden, that it's almost like a series of doors start shutting behind people. So plenty of people evacuated um, over the, the bridges up, up until a certain point. But gradually, as the morning progressed, um, it uh, people's uh, options, if you will, for getting off the island closed up. Um, and as I mentioned, people who were burned and bleeding were the immediate uh, recipients of, of this service that the, the boat lift um, ended up conveying all of these people and, and the injured and, and, and burned people uh, straight away benefited from, from that availability because the way that um, the, the disaster was unfolding, the fastest way, as I said, was, was by boat to get to actually across the river a mile to New Jersey was actually the fastest way to get people uh, the medical help that they needed. There were people with clothing melted into their bodies. There were people with really, really dramatic burns. There were people with glass shards in them. And the mariners who are, um, they are not trained first responders, but in order, for example, for me to get my Coast Guard license to be a US Coast Guard licensed marine engineer, I needed to pass shipboard firefighting training and tests. I needed to um, do first aid training and CPR and all of these different things. And so those things, plus the, the, the triage kits, or at least the bare minimum first aid kits that people had, that the Mariners had available, played a really huge role that day um, in being able to help people. And so here's just a quick timeline just to sort of remind us of what happened. So you have the first plane hitting, as I mentioned earlier, at 846. Then we have at 902, the game changes completely because there's pretty much at that point, no one who's thinking that this could have been an accident twice. Um, and so even, you know, if you read through the papers of uh, members of our government, they were still treating the plane like an accident for a very long time um, after the first hit. And then when the second hit, everything changes. So the first um, issue that affects the maritime world in an official capacity is that at 910, the US Coast Guard closes the port of New York and New Jersey and the, the bridges and tunnels onto Manhattan are closed. And so what this means, because you know, even if you're in a, 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 a traffic backup, and circumstances change and you know maybe there's splash flooding and you need to abandon your car your car is stopped you can actually leave the vessels in this hugely busy port of new york new jersey they don't have that option they're floating around and the only way that they can stop when you close a port is if they find a safe a safe place to to tie up um, and so that was a big, big job that the vessel traffic um, service was doing in the Port of New York, was being able to find places for all of these huge, huge vessels um, during this time. So this is the other time, I think you guys, can you see my um, cursor here? Um, this is the other time that's really important, which is 1045. So 1045 becomes really important because this is the first official call that goes out. So the US Coast Guard calls out for all available boats. It's then Lieutenant Michael Day, he's now I believe an Admiral. Um, and he says, if you wanna help with the evacuation report to Governor's Island. But note, we are looking at two hours into the maritime evacuation that is already underway. And so one of the biggest misconceptions that I, that I hear from people is that they think the Coast Guard orchestrated a boat lift. And in fact, they didn't. Um, in fact, it was actually individual mariners who stepped up and in this entirely spontaneous, improvised, unplanned way, all of these vessels of all these different types converged independently at first onto Manhattan Island because there were people pressed up against the shoreline, against the seawall, against the railings who were desperately in need of help. And their desperation um, really depended upon where they were. And you could talk to many different people um, 
really everybody's experience was so so completely different based on geography and timing. So there were some people who participated in the maritime evacuation, um, some folks, and I'll show you images of this later in the day, who they stood in line uh, for three hours waiting for a boat and they took a boat to New Jersey and they did so in relatively calm, relatively safe, further north uh, way. And if you were somebody who was stuck at the tip of Manhattan, this experience was characteristically different. There were people climbing over railings, there were people falling in the water, there were people jumping in the water, and depending on where you were on Manhattan Island, you could literally be trapped with no way off except by boat because of debris, because of the fires, because of everything that was going on there. And so it is truly remarkable to me, but it is the case that this was the largest evacuation, maritime evacuation in history. And we've gone all these years without real widespread recognition that this even happened. Um, nearly half a million people were stranded um, and were taken by boat. Um, there were at least 150 boats have been accounted for and probably more than that. And uh, the best estimates we have are that there were about 800 mariners um, or more who were involved in this, both working on the vessels themselves, but also helping on the shorelines um, in marinas and helping you know, to onload and offload passengers. So I wanna show some, um, some photographs of that day. I don't think there's anything that is um, particularly um, gory or gruesome, but you know this is not easy material. So just be forewarned that um, we're gonna be looking at photos of September 11th. So here is a photograph that was taken um, right at the tip of Manhattan. So the, um, the Coast Guard station is located right along the battery. So right at the very tippy end of Manhattan Island. And you can see here um, all these people pressed up against the shoreline waiting for any, any opportunity to get off the island. You can see the railing here. This railing is actually a relatively forgiving railing. You can see that there are people on both sides. There are people outside the railing, like this person here who's sitting. People fled to the water's edge because especially um, as the towers came down, they did so because they were looking for air, they were looking to breathe. So kind of like the people in the towers who pressed up against the windows, the open glass in the buildings for fresh air, people went to the water's edge for fresh air as well. So this actually is a photograph from later, but I, it's the best close-up that I could offer you um, about this railing and about the seawall that was hugely, hugely, um, had a huge impact on how things went that day. So this is Fireboat John J. Harvey. Um, I'm pretty sure this is me. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it is. Um, but this is later. This is actually in another panicked moment after the, um, on the 12th or the 13th, when there was a, uh, a rumor that spread throughout the pile that there was another tower coming down and it was a mass stampede. So I want you to take note of a couple things here. One, this is the railing and you see how it's curved inland. So basically trying to climb over that, especially if you're a firefighter and all this turnout gear is no easy feat. The other thing I want you to see is that this is just a cement wall. So there's no fendering at all to protect the vessels that are tied up alongside, that are um, in the earliest hours performing this evacuation. And also there's a huge gap you see here between the top of the cement seawall and the steel decks. And that actually determined the fate and actually caused um, the death, likely death of, of one individual on the morning of September 11th. And so this, the other thing to point out here, which I'll talk about again is, um, the uh, the lines here. So these are docking lines because there are no bollards, there are no there's no fendering, there's no cleats, there are, there are no safety ladders, there are no gaps in the fence to create a passageway for people to come down. And so yeah, you got one little ladder here, and you have all these other people trying to jump down regardless. So that was happening in the midst of the collapses as well much less clear air than you see here. Um, and, and it had huge impact, the choices that New York City made along the water's edge. 
So here you see, this is Pier A, um, and so we're a little further south than, um, than the photo I just showed you before, but here you see these ferries. So these are ferries, this is not their normal docking operations at all. They are able to, because of the, um, the way that the boats are built, they're able to nose up right along the seawall. Same thing with the tugboats. Very few boats can actually do that, can just stick their nose right up against the cement wall. Um, and um, and so this was really important that different boats had different capacities. They have different depths under the water. They have different um, tie up needs. They have different thrusters and different you know, engine capacities for being able to maneuver in tight spaces, all of these things. And what the Coast Guard did end up doing in this really, really helpful way was offering information uh, and suggestions for vessels who were operating out of their normal operations. I mean, tugboat, your Moran tug here is not going to be up against the seawall when things are going well. And so um, because of the, the fact that, and I'll, and I'll show you some photos of this too, but the fact that this is a port city. So this was a working waterfront. That means that there are obstructions and um, the vestiges of industry are all underwater. They're along the shoreline. There are all of these potential impediments. And so if you're navigating in unfamiliar waters, it can be really tricky. And the Coast Guard offered a lot of really important information to help people. Um, help mariners navigate in these unfamiliar waters. So here is another railing that I want to tell you about. So here we are at the South Cove. So we're a little bit further south. Still, the Trade Center is uh, just inland this way. This ends up being the site of um, a really harrowing story that I tell um, about a woman who is the nanny of a four-year-old. And where they live is just adjacent to this spot here. And, um, and the mother of the four-year-old has called the nanny realizing that there's trouble and said stay there stay there i'm coming and the nanny is trying to do her best to stay there and they end up actually barefoot running in the midst of the collapse and um and she ends up carrying the four-year-old and um and finding a police boat which ends up pulling into here into south cove now here it's it may be hard to see um but there's a wooden railing that existed all along this area. This is not typically a place where, where people are invited to actually get onto the water. People come and they, they fish and they come and they you know jog in the area and that kind of thing. But the whole infrastructure was really designed to keep people off the water. So there is a, um, uh, uh, a member of the NYPD Harbor Unit, um, Tony Servant, who um, comes and actually has his crewmate a uh, crew member come and tie a knot to these sections of railing and he runs down the whole row um, on the morning of September 11th and just plucks off the railings to make it easier for people to board. And at a certain point, I think a sergeant like yells at him and says, you know, you're destroying property. And he says, look around you, everything is already destroyed um, because the towers had already come down at that point. Um, and so where are these boats going to, oh, so this is, this is actually that street that I was telling you about um, where that um, where that nanny was um, with the the little girl that she was in charge of um, who she called kitten. And so there were many, many people, you know, pushing strollers, babysitters, nannies, parents, and um, some of the vessels really wanted to make it possible for for whoever's taking care of the children to have a stroller on the other side because they're about to go to a completely different state, right? They're going to New Jersey and what do they have and what do they need? And so there were some vessels who actually allowed um, people with children to bring the strollers and many, but many, many were left um, on shore. And so you just have these babes in arms on these boats with, you know, PFDs, no life jackets that are suited for them and things like that. Um, so here, this becomes a really important part of the stories that unfold. And it actually becomes a convergence point for many of the different stories that I tell in the book of different individuals who participated. So here we're in Jersey City, and this is a, an unused dock on a normal day. And it's kind of dilapidated. Um, it looks in pretty good shape at this point, but further out, um, there are like holes in the, in the boarding and things like that. And this ends up being where um, larger boats 
are able to tie up, including uh, Fireboat John D. McKean that day. And here you can actually see the, the destruction of this fence, this um, construction fence was actually done by firefighters because they needed, to, they had a boatload full of passengers, um, a number of whom were seriously injured and uh, one was likely already um, had died at this point and they needed to evacuate people off this pier, but the, um, but this area was all fenced off because the, the construction site. And so the firefighters actually took a partner saw, which they carry with them for firefighting and, and actually had to break open a hole in this fence um, so that people could get to what I'm gonna show you next, which is, um, oh, and this, this is um, a typical New York waterways ferry dock. So this became really, really important both for the ferries, but also as you see here, the police boats. So lower, lower to the water line, smaller vessels could use that docking facility. So here's another view of that. Um, so here you see, this is uh, the, the pier extended out. And so um, some passengers, um, some vessels tried to make space so that the waterways boats that were designed for those, um, those uh, docking facilities, could use them. So you have police boats also going to this other dilapidated pier. And here's a top down view of that same thing. And this is important because yes, you can see the construction site, you can see the hole in the fence that was created, but also this is the beginning, the beginnings of the triage centers that were established on the Jersey side. And so you see these color coded tarps that are used to designate who is in most dire need of medical care. And so these triage centers end up springing up all, all, all along um, the, the shoreline of New Jersey. And there are people in the office buildings here who also pull out all the stops to help people. They set up phone banks because people couldn't use their cell phones to let, let their loved ones know that they were across the river safely. They, um, there were uh, sometimes like custodial uniforms and things like that. So the people who had damaged clothing um, could, could change into. There were people sharing water, first aid kits. They were ripping off the first aid kits in their, their um, office buildings. And everybody was coming together to help. And that is the big message that I want to convey about this is that, um, is that yes, there was remarkable action, generous action, heroic action that happened. There were so many people who rose to this occasion who really went into brave danger to help others and at great risk them, to themselves, they, they, um, they stepped up to help others. And some of those people were first responders, but many of them were just everyday people. And they were the first first responders, which we see throughout history at disasters. The first first responders are almost always just everyday people. And what we see throughout history and throughout different kinds of disasters, despite the stories we are often fed in the media, disasters researchers have shown that by and large, people actually marshal to help. They share food, they share blankets, they share generators and fuel and all of these things. And actually over and over again, people help. So this picture has, um, so this is a Staten Island ferry. These, these are these huge vessels that can carry so many passengers and over and over, they carried huge numbers of passengers back and forth to Staten Island. And when you think about that, when you think about that choice, so this is the sort of the other view, right? This is taken from the Staten Island side before the second tower has come down, obviously. And just imagine as this progression, I showed you the timeline, the progression is taking place. You have these, um, these mariners taking their boat to safer shores offloading all of these passengers all along safer shores. And then they make the decision over and over again to cast off lines and turn their boats around and head straight for this. And that is the thing that I think it's really hard to recapture the depth of fear and unknowing. And people really felt this was, this was Armageddon and, um, and nobody knew what was going to be next. And Captain James Parisi is a, was a, um, Staten Island ferry boat captain that morning. And he, there were a couple really just 
beautifully powerful um, moments that he shared with me um, in the book. And one was um, that, that, he, um, that he had this moment crossing the deck. Um, so the Staten Island Ferry has two wheelhouses. So they pull into the dock and then the pilot the captain steps over the upper deck to get to the other wheelhouse to prepare for docking. And he talks about how the debris coming down, the smoke and the dust and all the plastic flying around through the air. And he was panicked. And, and yet when he felt, um, when he sort of experienced all of this greenish grayish dust coming down, it reminded, of being, reminded him of being a kid in the snow. And something about that calming presence and that connection and memory that he was able to make helped him recalibrate and helped him just find this place of calm that powered him through the rest of an incredibly long and harrowing day. But he also talked about how he's, he's talked about it with this great New York accent about how he felt like he was running this big orange target in the middle of the harbor because nobody knew what was next. The Empire State Building was very quickly evacuated because people figured that that was the next place to be hit. But even this giant ferry boat, the pilot thought that that boat was gonna be a target. So here we're back on the Jersey side um, and this became a really important um, part of this story, sort of where many of the stories converged. So this you might recall from before is, is that metal sort of thing sticking up where the ferries and we saw a New York City police boat pulling in. Um, and this is the pier alongside that I showed you that's a bit dilapidated. So here's what happens. There are a number of people whose stories I tell who end up completely separately individually on this boat. And so here they are in this picture. When I found this picture, it was just truly remarkable. Many of the people on the boat ended up stumbling onto the boat, climbing down or falling down that railing that I showed you earlier. Um, and um, one woman, it, it seems, uh, landed face first on the steel deck and it's um, not thought that she survived there were a number of other people whose stories converge and they end up at the World Financial Center right at North Cove where this boat is tied up waiting for orders when the first tower comes down and they end up caught in the dust cloud. There are two women who end up in the water. Um, they end up, well, I won't tell you how that story ends, um, but it's a uh, a really, uh, really worrisome time. And, um, and so then after the tower has come down, it's clear and the boat is full of people and the fireboat needs to get these people off so that they can go back and fight fires. There are raging fires. As, even aside from the Twin Towers themselves, there are absolutely raging fires going on. And, um, and while the boat is here tying up, and this is the, the, the photo that captures this moment, one tower is there, and then you see what happens next. And um, the tower came down and there's a, uh, this guy named Rich Varela who had been working in the World Financial Center. He was working as a telecom guy doing um, data management and things um, in this comp data room. And he ends up, it's a longer story, but he ends up caught in the cloud, he ends up jumping onto this boat. He ends up arriving in New Jersey, which is where he lives. And he ends up helping to take injured people off the boat. And then he sees the looks on the faces of the firefighters as they watch this tower come down and they're watching all of their fellow fire, firefighters perish in this moment. And he says, I'm going with you. And one of the firefighters says, what are you talking about? And he said, you guys need help. I'm going with you. And he went. So he was on the safe side. He was on the New Jersey side. He was not a firefighter. And he ended up going back with uh, the John D. McKean crew and actually running hose lines the whole day. In fact, that stroller shot showed um, some of those some of those whole line, hose lines. Maybe I can go back to it after. Um, so just another example of just the remarkable capacity that people had to help. Here's this same shot from another from another angle, and here you see a close up of the triage centers and how they're being used. And um, I 
in the book end up telling the story of some of these individuals that you see in the triage center. Another shot there. A little bit later, you can see the fireboat is already dispersed. Second tower has come down. And here again. So, you know, just imagine many of these folks, yes, they were from New Jersey. And so you have mariners taking all these people off, but then where do they go from there? And so there was an incredible shoreside effort that was made by, um, by people who worked in marinas, um, people who just worked in the area to try to coordinate buses. And these bus lines were actually called in to take people to, um, where did they go? What's it called? The um, totally blanking on the name in New Jersey, the, oh, the Meadowlands. So different places where people could go and reach out to family members and get picked up because you have a whole bunch of people. Some of them are from New Jersey. They need to get to other places in New Jersey. Some of them are from Manhattan. One woman, that nanny who I mentioned, ends up on the Jersey side and she's never been in New Jersey. And here she is with this four-year-old. What is she supposed to do? They're absolutely covered with dust. Um, here is just a sense of uh, the scope and scale of, of what's happening here. So initially you had, I, I showed you pictures of um, vessels going along the shore here. So further south here, um, right here, just north of North Cove, which, which was where the um, World Financial Center terminal that the ferry uh, boats used typically on a normal day. And you can see how even their options for where they can pull in are now disappearing. So the ferry boats in particular, they end up getting pushed further and further north up here along this seawall with no infrastructure to be able to, um, to carry out a safe rescue of passengers. And they're also fighting a tide. And so by nosing to the seawall with no facilities, they are, um, they're being pushed along and the boat is not designed to be able to do that. And now you need more space between different vessels so fewer people can get offloaded. And um, there was this incredible effort by um, Paul Amico who actually is the guy who built that, um, that um, earlier structure that I showed you on the, on the exchange point Jersey side um, that the, was the docking facility for the ferries. He did waterfront construction and he actually was a member of the downtown boat, boathouse and he realized, okay, there's some frontage that would be usable that would be a safer way for these ferries to dock. And so he actually broke in and used a cutting torch um, to make it possible for um, that to become another resource for mariners. Here you have just, I mean, just the tiny boats and this giant disaster, just to put that in scale. Here, um, a little bit later, so now the dust cloud is, um, has subsided a bit, both towers have come down. And thankfully, given the geography, the, uh, the cloud that day, the wind was blowing the cloud to, to us over here in Brooklyn. Um, but what that meant was the, there was more cl um, clear air along the western shore of Manhattan. So here is um, South Cove that I'd mentioned, further north is the North Cove. And so these vessels can now again go to the shoreline because just because the cloud came down but there are people already up against the railings getting evacuated and then they get covered in this dust cloud. And so now as the air clears, more and more mariners um, can come and meet them here at the water's edge. And there are people, um, who involved in the evacuation and would talk about how the whole shoreline was just covered in shoes. Just people jumping out of their shoes. A lot of people ended up in the water. Ferry boats made a lot of uh, water rescues that day. There were people getting swept out to sea. Um, and here's another sort of uh, chance to see the size and scale. Here you have a little bit later in that, in that day where you have all the tugboats racing. A lot of tugboats are based um, in on the Jersey side and also in Staten Island um, in those areas. And so they all just come racing um, to do this job for which they're absolutely not built, which is to move passengers. Um, and here they are, you can see um, this is, they're racing past Governor's Island toward the tip of Manhattan. Another view, so this is the view from a tugboat side and actually was taken by a tug captain um, who, who evacuated people that day. 
all of these boats, all these different companies. And, you know, these folks are in, you know, competing companies, if you will. And, you know, there's plenty of like, pissing matches among the maritime community but that day there was plenty of salty language for sure but so much collaboration and so much um just making space for each other and helping people do the job and saying okay you know you go in here and i'll go in after and just you know not clogging up the the radio channels um with a lot of unnecessary communication which is quite remarkable this is also taken by um that same tug captain um mike littlefield and what was happening is that these tugboats ended up becoming this makeshift ferry service. And um, I think I have a photo here, but maybe not. There's another um, scale giving photo where, so what would happen is the tug crews um, actually painted um, bed sheets, spray painted bed sheets with Hoboken or other destinations so that people, of course, when bad things happen, you wanna go home. And so the closer people could get if they were going to be able to go home to New Jersey, the better. So just to orient you here, here we have, this is the South Cove that I was talking about. And this is North Cove that I was talking about. This is where we started our day here um, with um, Captain Pat Harris. This is where his boat was tied up. The Trade Center Towers are here. This is the World Financial Center and that ferry, um, ferry terminal is just uh, a little ways up here. Okay, so later in the day, so you have all of these people who just walked north. There are plenty of people who were far enough away from the disaster unfolding that they could, they could just walk north, which isn't to say that they weren't terrified, especially there were people who didn't wanna walk north because they thought, okay, that's where the Empire State Building is. Who's gonna get hit next? Um, so people really, a lot of people sort of instinctively um, clung to the water's edge and just said, I'm going to be away from buildings, I'm going to be in as much fresh air as I can get. For People waited for hours and hours, like three hour long lines um, for these ferry operations um, that, that, um, that departed throughout the entire day. Um, and what is really incredible to think about is that despite how just totally terrifying the situation was. The panic that people had did not stand in their way. Um, there are so many stories of even in just really awful conditions with debris coming down that people parted ways, uh, parted sort of parted the seas, the crowd, so that injured people could board on the boats first. Um, and over and over again, people I spoke with talked about this, just this humanitarian concern for others that was in full force that day. So I wanted to mention that the Mariners, it wasn't just the boat lift. Um, they actually played a huge role in um, not only just taking people off the island, but actually bringing uh, personnel, rescue workers and others to the island of Manhattan to help as well as loading on supplies. And this became a really instrumental part of the job so this is what the pile looked like down there. This was taken by Chase Wells, um, who uh, was also serving aboard Fireboat John J. Harvey um, with me um, in those days. And um, these are photographs that he took. And just, I mean, where do you even begin? Where do you even begin when this was a rescue effort where people really believe that there are people trapped in pockets, um, that there was all kinds of, um, you know, magical thinking that happens in grief, um, that there would be so many people that could be rescued. And, and you probably all remember the images of empty stretchers and hospital beds um, outside of hospitals. And they're just, people were not, not surviving. You either survived in that moment or you didn't um, with very few exceptions. So here I wanted to draw a link, as I mentioned, my first book really delved into the, the harbor and the fact that all along the seawall of Manhattan, the world's cargo changed hands and, um, and that shipping had fueled the city's economy and Manhattan had been the dominant American seaport from uh, before the Civil War and um, was one of the world's largest um, and most major international ports uh, by the 1900s. And so those vestiges of industry um, were very much, you know, had been removed um, and have since been removed even further um, 
since 2001. And so what that meant was that there were vessels having to deal with these things like these this curved railing. So here we are, this is North Cove to reorient, and this is the pile of stuff. And so what was really powerful to me as you know, I got a little bit further away from what had happened um, and got some perspective was that all of a sudden this idea of break bulk cargo where everything is moved by hand, it's loaded by hand onto a boat and loaded um, by hand off a boat, all of a sudden Manhattan returns to that um, with boats just bringing over cases of water and masks and eyewash and everything that you can think of because this is what the shoreline once looked like. It had all of these finger piers that created 76 miles of usable frontage. So all of this, um, all of this uh, infrastructure, much of it had already been ripped out. Now you just see these, what I call pigboard forests, just these forests of pilings that are all that remain. Uh, and there are very few finger piers still um, in existence. But this is what it once looked like along those shores with piles of stuff that was moved by hand. And all of a sudden here we were back in the return of that. Um, and, and that had everything to do with the, the, the fact that there was no um, infrastructure to be able to handle this along the shore um, in, in 2001. So just a little historical perspective there. Here you go, you see, so this is the Winter Garden. This is North Cove, as I mentioned. This is Fireboat John J. Harvey, where we were right along that railing. And here, this pile of goods um, is brought. And um, within days, this will become what's called the general store. And it became this whole infrastructure with a tent and everything was organized and you could find everything that you needed, extra boots, um, masks, underwear, uh, dog food for the rescue dogs, everything you could think of was there. And um, just rounding up the slides, um, this is uh, taken some, some time after, I believe on the second day. Um, and here's the pilot boat New York, which is where the, um, before they tied up here at North Cove, Pilot Boat New York had been the center for operations for the Coast Guard. They teamed up with the Sandy Hook pilots who are just the masters of, of the harbor in terms of harbor knowledge, knowing the waterways, knowing the depths, the infrastructure, everything that's available. And so this served as a sort of command post. Um, and then that command post service continued here in North Cove um, uh, when the after the boat lift and when um, it became more of a um, supply operation. And then uh, one final note here is to talk about the, the job of the Mariners wasn't over um, when, um, when the boat lift ended. So I talked about supplies, I talked about moving personnel that continued for, for months after um, the, the trade centers were attacked. And they also, I showed you that picture of um, of all the debris and where do you begin? How do you possibly clear all of that rubble? And the way you do it is you do it by barge. And so what that meant was that the maritime community played an incredibly powerful, important role um, moving debris. And so um, debris would be um, piled into barges and then would be shipped out, um, shipped to Red Hook for processing and then um, taken to uh, Fresh Kills where um, there were people with the solemn task of looking for any uh, remains or personal items to try to identify uh, people. And so they played an incredibly important role um, in that part of the operation as well. And so I'm hoping we'll have the chance to all see each other now. Um, I'm really, really grateful for you being here um, and listening to me uh, talk a bit about this, but I'd really love to, to cater it to your questions and, and, um, and answer any questions that you have and, and make this more of a discussion if we can do that. If you have questions, you can drop them in the chat. I am gonna start with a question that I wrote in the chat, but didn't share because I knew I was gonna be able to read it out loud. Um, which is has, you talked a lot about New York City not having any um, real infrastructure for, for boat tie up along most of the seawall anymore. Um, so I was curious to know, 
uh, if New York City had changed any of that post 9-11, like did they install cleats? Did they install, you know, any fenders or like make provisions for future potential evacuations or anything like that? Um, the mariners who I've spoken with about this just in the past few weeks are quite dismayed at the lack of um, lack of improvement. There have been some improvements for sure. There is now um, uh, along North Cove or along the southern edge of, of North Cove where you saw the pictures of fireboat John J. Harvey, there is now like very quietly, there was some fendering that was <laughs> that was put in, um, but there's the, the railings are still there. Those are the same railings. In fact, the uh, fireboat John D. McKean, that crew ended up cutting out some of that railing um, to try to make operations better, um, go more smoothly. And that was of course, repaired and it's not a gate, it's just back to being a railing. Um, and I actually, I neglected to come back to that, um, the, the photograph with the, with the lines, the docking lines, we literally had to tie to trees. So the boat was tied to trees. And while I was down there, I was actually inland at the time, helping to sort supplies because what happened was um, there were just boxes and boxes and everything was completely, mismatched and you couldn't find anything. And people would come up and say, I need batteries for my flashlight. And I'd say, I don't have batteries. And then I'd go digging and I'd find, you know, batteries. And so we needed order and, um, and it needed to be further away from the dust pile and closer to the shoreline where you saw that, um, where I said the general store got established. So in any event, that photograph that I shared of the, the firefighters largely climbing over the wall, that was happening in a total panic because there was um, uh, a rumor that another building was coming down. And, um, and, uh, and so everyone was stampeding to the water's edge and they're getting ready to hook around along the water's edge to try to get away. And all these lines are stretched across. And so then it becomes this bottleneck and people are tripping and people are clamoring to get onto the boats. And the other piece of it was that if you're tied to a tree, you can't undock quickly, you can't cast off lines quickly. And so after that event, um, Pam Hepburn, Pamela Hepburn, who's uh, was a tub captain for many, many years in, in New York Harbor, she actually helped our deck crews um, set up these toggle boat bolts so that we could evacuate quickly. Cause we had got engines fired up. Like we were getting ready to leave um, in, you know, in, in what we were fearing was a collapse. And, um, and yeah, so I, I, I fear that not enough, um, that the lessons didn't translate to enough action. Um, one other question I had, because, uh, you know, obviously I think pretty much everybody on this talk was alive during September 11th. That's not true of everybody anymore. Right. Um, but uh, I was getting a little choked up listening to you talk about some of this. So how, this is more of a personal question, but how do you manage the emotions around that day and, and communicating about this event? Um, poorly often. <laughs> um, I, I did not s speak about or want to like have anything to do with that day for many, many years. And, you know, other people sort of figured out their, the story that they were willing to tell and told that story. And I just didn't tell any story at all um, for a long time. And, and I had real discomfort with the idea of reining those experiences in with language um, and uh, and I it it concerned me and, and I was afraid that um, the full uh, intensity of it would would get boxed in and then I realized that actually the memories were fading and that there's actually a deep human need for stories true stories and when I say stories I'm not talking about made up but like to understand what has happened to us to understand our history and at a certain point I recognized it was really at the 10th anniversary um I recognized the importance of documenting and sharing this history this history that belongs to all of us because this is us as humans and what we are capable of and it's not the typical narrative you know um it's it's really just everybody coming together and working to help each other and i realized that my own anguish over um dealing with these issues was um 
was surmounted by the need for this story to be told, especially now uh, for many reasons. One is that we're having this moment of reckoning with some of the brutal, brutal history of the founding of our country and colonialism and you know, all of these things and the, the legacy and the you know, continued perpetuation of systemic inequities. Um, all of that needs to be reckoned with. And we also need to remember that this is actually also a piece of who we are. This is actually another way that we are and who we can be. And to remind us that these divisions that we arbitrarily set up between ourselves that are so, that feel so real and painful and have life and death consequences right now, um, it's not the only option. And we have been other people and we can do that. We, can, we have, we, we we have this capacity and we can make those choices. And it looks like Susanna has a hand up. Um, but the Sorry. question that we had for you, Jessica, um, is how, like, this is such an extraordinary story. Thank you for sharing it with us tonight. Is it difficult for you to have to keep telling the story over and over? Yeah, it, um, it wrecks me, honestly, quite honestly. I mean, it, uh, I, over and over again, have to sort of steel myself to, to do it. And um, there are times when it goes more smoothly than others. And there are times when I, it, you know, somebody asked me, she's like, well, what happens? Do you cry? And I, no, I don't. And probably if I did, that would be more adaptive, but I lose words, like it, they just disappear. I lose numbers. That's the first thing to go when I'm talking about it. And, you know, this is one of the things as a journalist and as a historian that I think is really important for us to, um, to keep in mind, especially given just the horrific death toll of this global pandemic that we're in and the really, really overwhelming climate crisis that we're facing is that um, <laughs> so many things. One, first off, that we're completely interdependent. We are absolutely interdependent, interconnected, and your safety is my safety is contingent upon your safety is contingent upon his safety and her safety and their safety and that's just the reality right and that we need we need for our democracy to be able to have a clear understanding of what's actually happening we need facts we need journalists getting the story and this stuff takes a toll and if we don't recognize the toll even just as a journalist even if i hadn't been actually at ground zero um, with my own psychological stuff from that. Um, it's important that we recognize that and that we, um, the DART Center is doing really, really good work around this. Um, but that's sort of a um, inside baseball conversation, I guess, about journalism and, and historians and sort of self-care. Um, but yeah, thanks for asking. Leah Thank just you. asked, uh, yeah. what is the third book facing forward over Jessica's left shoulder? Very strategically placed. Good job. Uh, uh, thanks. Um, My River Chronicles in hardcover, the blue one, and the, in in paperback is the yellow, the like weird McDonald Land colors <laughs> here, and then um, Saved at the Seawall is here. I think that's was that the question? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Does anybody else want to have any questions for Jessica? Oh, Edith, is that how you say your name? Yes, thank you, Jessica, um, for bringing us so close to this in a way that we have been spared. And then with both your honesty and your collective memories in the sense that those that you have uh, brought together from others as well. And um, how receptive were people to speak to you about this? It's a great question. Um, there are as many answers as there are individuals. There are people who, um, who told me their stories in the full raw detail for the very first time they hadn't told. They had spared their families. Um, there are people who had told their stories a lot of times um, who had um, sort of you know, I, I've learned so much more about trauma since then. Um, and in fact, as a book collaborator, almost all of the projects I'm working with um, by and large end up being about uh, traumatic um, memoirs and, and, and other materials and histories. Um, so I think I know the, the healing power that 
that piecing blurs of overwhelming events into narratives, I know that that's an adaptive strategy that humans have. And so I have a better understanding of why that happens. Um, and uh, it made a difference. I really see, saw myself as, as um, particularly capable to serve as a bridge because I could speak boat with the mariners and they could just talk and they could say, yeah, the current was really ripping. We were, you know, starboard side two, you know, and the bow was doing this and, you know, and then the thrusters did that and, and they could just talk. And so they knew that I would just take it in and then it was my job to translate it for the reader so that they can feel a part of what's going on. And I also um, had the personal experience of being down there and, and, you know, knowing what it's like to have breathed in that dust. And, um, and I think that helped uh, people who had been uh, evacuated uh, feel comfortable sharing their stories with me. And there, there's, you know, one particular individual I can think of um, who just couldn't, wouldn't, didn't, just couldn't. And so I, you know, I, I worked around it um, and told the story of other people in, in their midst um, and did it that way. And to follow up, how did you find people and, and what length of time expired when you're doing this, when you're returning to collect it? Um, it's a really hard question to answer because it was such an organic process. So for me, when I, when I was there at the Trade Center site, I, I'm a writer. And so I had a notebook and I just wrote things down. Um, and so, but it wasn't for anything. I never imagined I would write a book about this. I never wanted to. I frankly was invited by an editor to do it. And I was like, no, <laughs> I was like, this is, I can't immerse myself in this. Um, and um, I think that I made the right decision ultimately. I mean, to see, I mean, it took 20 years, but finally this story is widely known. And that is so important to me. Um, but it's taken a toll. Um, so I had no intention of writing about this at all, but it just, you know, I started taking notes on September 12th. Um, in terms of it being a formalized thing, um, that happened after the 10th anniversary. I wrote a short piece um, about the boat lift, just like, hello, this happened. Nobody, there was no clear understanding that it happened. And part of it was the mariners were not like, hey, you know, look at me, <laughs> because it was just, it was, and they would tell you over and over and over again, this is just what you do. Like you would have done it too. Can't tell you how many people said that, you know, you would have done it too. Anybody would have done it. This is just, you know, people needed help and you help them. Like what, why, what do we have to talk about? You know? Um, and so for a piece that, you know, for, for a time that, that was a part of it. Um, so formally, I, um, I started working on this as a book um, on the 10th anniversary right around there. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. I appreciate it. And it's so great to get some feedback. It's very weird to, you know, Zoom is great in so many ways, but it's like weird to talk into a void. <laughs> so it's really nice to hear. There's, you know, there's no, there's no communication. There's no head nod that I can look for. So I'm glad that um, I was able to, to speak in a way that resonated. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if anybody else has a question, they could put in the chat or raise their hand, but I have another, I'm like dominating the questions, right? Um, so the Maritime Museum became aware fairly early on, I think, of the documentary film Boat Lift, narrated by Tom Hanks. I was wondering if you were involved with that or, or had any connection with that and, and what you thought of it. What was the last thing, what I thought of it? What you thought of it, yeah. Ah, um, so I wasn't involved in the production of it at all. Um, I, I thought it was, and I still think it's a really great short tool for getting the word out there. And I really love the way that um, mariners are enabled to just tell their own story and in their, in their own voices. And that, that speaks really powerfully to me. Um, and I think it's really wonderful that Tom Hanks voiced it and it was just you know perfect for him to be the voice for that. Um, and, uh, and I'm very grateful because it's short and because it's so widely viewed. And, um, and so it, it can be an easy thing that someone can share to, you know, to, to find out more uh, or to, to spur their interest to even know this happened. Um, 
And since then, um, Spike Lee's documentary, New York City Epicenters, has been a really, really important um, piece of the history. He actually um, told me that he learned about the boat lift through my book, which is very meaningful to me. Um, and he has a whole chapter, chapter six of his eight chapter um, docu-series is about the boat lift. Um, and so a number of us mariners were interviewed um, and he has, you know, he's collected footage. He's, he, he has this story and tells it in, in, in a really, really powerful way. Um, so I really, it's, it's very, very intense and um, left me pretty rattled to watch it. And I've been immersed in this stuff for a long time, but uh, so I, you know, proceed with caution, but it's, it's extremely powerful and it's a really important um, encapsulation of our history and drawing the links between September 11th and the COVID pandemic in New York and what it meant to be here. I did not know about that. So thank you for, yeah. for sharing. I'll have to check it out. Does anybody else have any? Oh, yes. Okay. So then asks, um, she says, I love my river chronicles. Are you still oh, doing you. stints on working shifts and tugs? I actually was up until I think it's I, I retired, I think, two years ago from um, Fireboat John J. Harvey. I'm now chief engineer emerita, which is a lovely place to be. <laughs> and um, and it just it, it the writing work that I'm doing has been all consuming. Um, and so it just it wasn't it didn't make sense in my life um, to to keep to keep doing that work, uh, which doesn't mean that it won't come back in some way, um, I'm open to that. But right now the writing work keeps coming. Um, and so I'm really um, working hard at that. Thank you, I'm so glad you love the book though. That's great. I wanna know if there's any other maritime themed books on your docket. Um, on my docket, no. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any exceptions to that. No, no. I mean, really, it's um, I, I'm deeply immersed in the craft of of uh, narrative nonfiction and um, and really helping other people's stories come come to the light, <laughs> um, and that's really really rewarding work for me. Um, ah, you have children. How do you explain? Oof. Okay, so badly. <laughs> Um, uh, how do you explain um, September 11 to your children um, and what you ex you and others experienced to them? So I actually um, I actually ended up writing about this this year um, for CNN.com, and I'm happy to share the link, or Sarah can share the link with others, or you can go to my website, which all my journalism is there. Um, because I didn't for years. Um, I have a five-year-old, almost six, and a nine-year-old, and I just, I just couldn't. And, um, but at a certain point, it felt irresponsible to me, um, and I didn't want other people to do it for them either. Um, and so this is the year I actually, finally, um, I actually researched, I interviewed uh, mental health professionals and got some advice and spoke with other people who had told their children who, you know, a, a guy who had been in Stuyvesant as a, as a high school student um, and how he ended up sort of by accident having to tell his children what he had been through. Um, and so I, yeah, a little bit, I have told them a little bit and I just really try to volunteer as little information as I can and just let their questions lead, lead the way. Thanks for asking. Can you read them, the John J. Harvey book, the tips book? No. 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 I, I, I thought about doing it this year, but I, I couldn't do it. Does anybody else have any other questions? Um, just quick, Jessica, the CNN article that you're referring to, is that the um, how the 9-11 anniversary can provide lessons for healing from COVID-19 trauma? Is that the one you were referring to? That's another one. That's okay. not the same one. Um, so uh, that one is, um, this, this gentleman just has a really powerful story about his dad and, um, and grief and how we can use the anniversary grief that comes from the anniversary of individuals' deaths um, to... Uh, as a resource really. Um, and that one, yeah, so that's that one. And the other is called something like um, traumatic material. 
Um, I can find it for you. It's it's um, speaking speaking with children about traumatic events. I think is what. Oh it's yes, how to talk to your kids about traumatic events according to your 9/11 responder. That one. There you go. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will also put that one in the chat. Great. Thank you. I want to check it out. I really I really hope that um, that this this material can help people. I mean, if you if we only keep it in the doom category, it's not gonna serve us. Um, and so, you know, I wrote a piece for the Daily Beast about this hero narrative and how we get trapped in these ideas of helpers and everybody else. And, um, and that's what I really wanted to, what I still want to really bring to light that this is a choice that all of us have. And, you know, very few of us are gonna be called upon to race toward the Manhattan Island on fire on a boat. That's not the choice that's gonna confront most of us. But there are so many smaller choices that we make every day that are toward helping, toward humanity, toward recognizing that we are all shared human, you know, hum shared human experience. And, and, you know, it sounds trite and how sad is it that that sounds trite at this point, but like, we are in this together. We're on this spinning ball all together and we're all we got. We are all we have. And, um, and that those simple kindnesses and simply looking at the other person and recognizing that you have no idea what personal hell they're going through, you know, and to cut people some slack and to give people space and to just assume the best and not the worst. God, how powerful is that? If we each take one baby step in that direction, that is, that's game changing. That is transformative. And that kind of kindness and goodness is so contagious. And we need some good contagion right about now. Because there's plenty of the other. So it looks like we have one last question here. Peter says, it may seem strange, but you're talking to me think of John Glover in the Battle of New York, Wedding of the Waters, the Titanic, and 9-11 as a maritime story of New York. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the history, I mean, that's why it's so important that this history get collected because it is, it's like part of a larger whole, right? All of these things are happening in context of each other. And if we don't have all of these pieces of the stories and if we're not able to draw those links that you're, that you're um, pulling at here, the threads and put them together and understand the context, I mean, we're losing out, we're missing out on, on our story. This is our story, not just us Mariners, not just us New Yorkers, but all of us. And, um, and I think it's such an important counterbalance um, to some of the other stories that we hear um, of the worst of, of human behavior. Um, I think it's really, really important, especially right now. So I'm just gonna ask one last question before we go, <laughs> unless somebody else thinks of others. Um, I know there's been a lot of emphasis in recent years on waterfront parks in yes. New York City um, and kind of, uh, transforming the waterfront to be more accessible to the general public. How is that affecting um, the more working, the working waterfront in New York City? And, and I'm just curious to know if, if um, those places are getting squeezed out by some of the redevelopment that's happening. Absolutely, 100% they are. And I think the biggest thing to recognize is that um, anything that's happening along the waterfront should be waterfront specific use. It should take advantage of that incredible resource. And um, I think part of that is what was happening with the, with these, the construction of these railings and plucking up the, the infrastructure of industry and replacing it with like sparkling esplanades. And I think it's, it's so important that we are able to touch our river again, that we are able to be at our waterfront again, because for a while it was just a skeevy dark place that nobody wanted to, you know, everybody wanted their back to the waterfront because it was, um, for like a hundred years, basically, yeah, or yeah, more, yeah. yeah. A long time, a long, long time. And I really get deep into that um, in in my my book, my River Chronicles, and like how sort of culturally we ended up turning our backs on the waterways. Um, 
but it's really important that the way that we that we're not only constructing this for a passive view, that there have to be ways for us to actually engage with the water and by boat, by by swimming. I mean, there are swims, cove to cove, where people go North Cove, South Cove, um, and swim, which is a very intense swim. I hear it's like being in a uh, in a washing machine because the currents are so powerful. Um, but yeah, the, um, what's that? I was just gonna say in the Hudson River they have an eight bridges swim. Yes, where yes. they swim from from the Rip Van Winkle Bridge to uh, the George Washington Bridge, and I'm like, I don't, I can't imagine how people do it. And that's, I mean, New York City Harbor is the currents are crazy down there, but there's no joke in the Hudson either. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, and that actually really, um, you know, decided the fate of a lot of individuals who you know, had this thought, I'm going to swim to Jersey. I mean, that was their idea, um, which is not something you should undertake lightly. Um, uh, in any event, I think, so I think there has to be, there, there's a happy balance that must be attained where you're actually using the waterfront, the frontage there for water, water specific use so that it's not just, um, you know, turned into an Ikea. I mean, we lost a graving dock, an ability to fix large vessels to an Ikea parking lot, you know, and that's not waterfront specific use. And, you know, it's, that will never come back. And so as long as there's a mindfulness and as long as um, the, the waterways are often called the sixth borough and there needs to be representation of the sixth borough as these decisions are made. Um, and there are a lot of people working really hard to make sure that that's the case. Portside, New York is a great example. Um, Carlina Salguero is doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, Waterfront Alliance, they actually have a gala coming up um, on October 12th um, and they do a lot of work in this area, but it's, it's so important. And it's really important given climate change and the fact that rising sea levels is going to keep affecting all of us. Um, so it ha we have to reckon with our water or it's going to reckon with us. There have been a lot of um, conversations with some controversy in a lot of Hudson River towns also about redevelopment of waterfronts um, and kind of how on the Hudson River in particular, historically, the waterfront was like where the poor people lived. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's that's where the work happened in the industry. And now, um, you know, a lot of the vestiges of that, I'm thinking in particular of the fishing village in Hudson, Yep. Um, on the North Bay there are, are being kind of threatened with redevelopment. I'm thinking about Henry Gordine's Dean of the Hudson, his fishing shack in Austin being removed mm. to put in condos. You know, a lot of this, a lot of this infrastructure is getting lost. And if you look at a historic map of New York, lower Manhattan, like you said, it's the matchsticks. That's, it was all yeah. for boats. And now almost all of that is gone. So, yes. Yeah. yeah which is not to say that we need to reinvent the past, right? I mean, we need to be mindful of it though. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, we're not gonna revert back to breakable cargo. We're, we're not gonna transform, you know, container shipping, well, we're not gonna revert, right? Don't say that to Apollonia and the sail freight movement. <laughs> well, sorry, as, <laughs> as the major way that yeah. we receive our goods, that's not, that's not gonna happen. And so it's not that we need to return to some antiquated way of doing things. It's that we need to be mindful that there are lessons learned in, in various ways of putting these things together. And let's use our big, our big brains and, and, and creativity to devise solutions that take more individuals into account, for sure.